I would like to thank Enix Sears for partnering with us to conduct this webinar. ALA is committed to helping you learn new skills to grow your business. We intend for today's webinar to help you move from where you are right now to the vision of your ideal future. Today's program is ALA and AIA approved for one learning unit. We will email a certificate of completion to everyone completing the webinar. For those participants who are AIA members, if you did not provide your AIA number upon registration, um, there was an area on the registration to put your AIA number, but if you did not do that, please email your number to ALA at alatoday.org by end of day today, so we can report your credit. Now to get started, as I mentioned, our speaker today is Enoch Sears. Enoch is a California licensed architect and is the founder of Business of Architecture. He is dedicated to helping architects grow their firms through effective and unique business strategies. Enoch is the managing partner of the Architect Marketing Institute and co-developer of ArcReach, a client relationship management software tool that helps all right, and with that introduction, I'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> so, Joanne, we lost your introduction there, but I'm here, and I hear you loud and clear. So, Joanne, maybe check your sound settings. I know that that was kind of the end of the intro you were going to do there anyways, so I think we're okay with that. Okay, I think I lost the audio connection there, okay? Joanne, are you still there? Hey, Joanne, I lost the audio connection there for a second. Are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for that introduction, Joanne. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I can just vouch for what Joanne says about the ALA wanting to help you grow your business and be more successful as architects because, you know, in our conversations behind the scenes, she's made it very clear, Enoch, you know, I really only want to bring the best content possible to our members. You know, we have a great group here. And so I know that, you know, thanks to Joanne, it's on, you guys have great leadership there in the ALA. So it's a fabulous organization and very glad to be on today. So thank you for that, Joanne. You're welcome. All right, so if, if we do have any technical glitches that happen during the webinar, just hang on. Sometimes they do happen, just the nature of this digital format. You know, it does have some advantages, you know, being that we can be here together from around the world and some disadvantages that, you know, sometimes we do have some technical glitches. Now, I'm just going to turn on my webcam here so you can see that I am living in the flesh here. <laughs> This is not this is not a robotic recording or anything. And I want to know I want to know a little bit about you here just to jump off. So I see we have a very good turnout here today. And I want to orient you on how to use the control panel and the systems of this webinar software. First of all, you may be wondering why I have this microphone. Well, it's because I run uh, the top rated interview podcast for architects. It's been fun doing that. Does anyone here is anyone a listener to the Business of Architecture podcast? I'm just curious. And if you aren't, trust me, I will not be offended. Is anyone listen or a regular listener to the Business of Architecture podcast? Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a control panel. There's a place there where you can ask questions to staff. Both myself and Joanne will be able to see those questions and we'll answer them throughout today's presentation. So just go ahead and test that out. Let me know that you can hear and see us okay. Hopefully we've, we've actually been broadcasting and haven't been speaking to the ether over these past several minutes. And just let me know where you're calling in from and a little bit about who you are. So once again, on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a place there where you can ask questions to staff. And I'm just going to wait here because I always like to make sure that uh, the technical part works out before we continue on because it would be a bummer to go through our entire presentation today when no one can hear us. Melina, good to see you on here. You are a frequent. I, I Yeah, I've seen you on our presentations before. Good to see you on. And Scott says Chicago is cold and gray today. Hey, Judith from Craw Crawfordsville, Indiana. Fantastic. David, first seminar. Good to have you on here. Jeff, great, great. Well, that's excellent. Uh, hearing me in Michigan, Frank. Frank, welcome. Wesley's first seminar and Chicago. from uh, uh, Courtney from Chicago agrees with Scott about the weather. Welcome, Jim Pitson from Milwaukee. Hey, Jim. Good to see you on here today. So it looks like we're all working okay. Now, I hope <laughs> Joanne mentioned that I am a, I'm, I am a California-based architect. You know, I hope you don't hold that against me. 
So if we can get over that, then we can continue on with today's presentation. And I'm just curious, is there anyone from, I know the ALAs, you know, a lot of architecture firms in the Mideast, is there anyone out here from out west? I'd be curious to know. All right, so just on that note, uh, that's why I have the microphone, because I do run the top-rated interview podcast for architects. So if any of you are podcast listeners, podcasts are a fantastic way to grow your mind and grow your knowledge uh, 100% free. So today, with the amount of podcasts that are available, a podcast is basically just, it's like a radio show that you can get on your phone. If you go to, if you have an iPhone, you can subscribe on iTunes and Android as well. And they're free radio broadcasts, and you can get anything from personal development to the latest updates and news. NPR has several successful podcasts. And of course, I run the Business of Architecture podcast. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because it is a fantastic business education. Every single week, I bring on some of the top thought leaders and uh, architecture firm owners to share what's working for them in the business side of architecture. And so that really is a valuable way to grow your mind, you know, maybe turn out some of the noise that we hear on the news that can a lot of times be very negative. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about uh, in regards to that. All right. So that's just a little bit about me. Thank you for the introduction. I want to give you a brief, just a very, very brief story. This, this presentation is not about me. It's actually about you. But I want to show you where I came from so you can understand what we're going to be going over today because I'm pretty passionate and excited about this topic because it's, it's influenced my life greatly. So this is me back in 1990. I had a paper route. I'm curious if anyone here had a paper route. And throughout this presentation, I'll be asking lots of questions because I want this to feel like a fireside chat, like we're all gathered here in a room together, we're sitting around a table and we're discussing business and what works for us, helping each other together. That's the goal of this. So if it seems like I'm asking a lot of questions, it's because, you know, although we're separated by hundreds and thousands of miles, I want to be able to bring us together uh, in that format to be able to have a little bit more interact interactivity. Well, here's Wesley. Wesley says, I delivered the Stars and Stripes in Germany. Fantastic. So was I'm curious if that was a military base that you were on. So some of you have done this, and this was me back in 1990. You know, I had a paper out. So from an early age, I was taught like a work ethic to work hard. You know, I got up early in the morning when it was cold out. Of course, I don't even deserve to say that because I grew up in California where cold is, it's all relative, right? But I would go around and, and throw these. At, after high school, I would get out and I would do wrestling. And so I had a very full schedule. Well, I went to architecture school in upstate New York, and I later... I got my dream job with an architecture development firm based out of Houston, Texas, where we did everything from medical office buildings, hospital refurbishments, uh, and culminating in 2008, I was sent down to Central America to Panama, literally my dream job, earning near six figures as a young, young architect, and I was just living on top of the world. You know, every day after work, I'd go snorkeling. Even some days during work, I'd be out there at the beach just hanging out, you know, um, and we were, we were doing some resort development, second family homes. You know, real estate was booming during that time, and it seemed like everything was speculation. We were selling these condos, and it was like, man, this is exactly why I got into architecture. Living the dream, right? A lot of you probably remember that. You're probably up to your ears in work at that time. Well, we all, you know, so it was fun for me because we were just doing design schemes and really cool architecture, and, uh, and then you can probably guess the next part of this story. So... Uh, here's me in 2009. <laughs> okay, I know there's it's it's kind of different when I'm not in a live room with people, but hopefully there's a little bit of laughing and giggling going on right here uh, because literally, you know, I went from having my dream job to the next year. A lot of you can probably relate with this. Literally, um, literally having a paper route. I, I kid you not. I really did have a paper route. I was on unemployment because that that company could no longer afford to run an office down in Panama. And uh, yeah, I see a lot of other people saying, laughing, <laughs> Wesley, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, Nijin and uh, Wesley says, lost my last architecture firm job in 2008 too. So we know how this goes. And, you know, during this time, it was really, it was a time of growth for me because I was, you know, I'd had to get up at basically about 1.30 in the morning. I would go throw the local newspaper in my little beat up Honda car. And then during the daytime, because none of the architecture firms were hiring and there wasn't any work, I would substitute teach at uh, Fresno Unified School District, which if any of you know anything about Fresno, yeah, enough said, okay? But let's, let's get down to it. This is why we do what we do. And so today, during today's presentation, as we talk about goals and as we talk about your vision of the future, 
I have a couple goals for you. This is not going to be a magic bullet, but I want you to walk away from here inspired to take action and have a little bit more clear focus about what exactly you want in your life. So what inspires me? I'm inspired by my family and my kids. So I have six children. Yes, I'm just waiting for the gasps to, to subside. Uh, this is when my wife was gone one day and I was taking care of the kids. We took them out for, for lunch at the local burger joint. And, you know, seeing these kids grow, being able to provide them opportunities, that is what drives me. So a key over what we're going to be going over today is what drives you, right? So just to show you that I'm not making this up um, in terms of setting goals and being able to achieve something, Here's my income from 2011 to 2015. So back in 2011 when I was working at, you know, at a, a great architecture firm with a normal project architect salary, um, I was later laid off in 2012 for the second time. That was a lot of fun. But you can see what happened after that 2013. Uh, my income went dramatically up. And I feel that it's because I unlocked a lot of the principles that you're going to be learning about today. So as I said, this isn't about me. This is about you. And so what I'm going to do now is let's, I'm going to turn off my webcam just so we can focus on the presentation. And let's go ahead and get into it. All right. So I would like to ask you a question. Where do you want to get to? So you have, you're, you're at a certain point right now in your life, in your career. And let's just focus on career right now. But you can even include things in your life. You know, what is it that, what is the change that you would like to see in the next 12 months? Is it uh, better quality and kinds of projects? Is it perhaps working less and having a higher profit margin so you have more free time? You know, where does it hurt, so to speak? If you were to go into the doctor and he was asking you about your business, you know, where, what, what's the itch you need to scratch? Where, where does it feel like it's hurting right now? Where do you want to get to? I go and drop that into the chat box and let's, let's see what y'all say here. See, we're up to quite a few attendees here. So I welcome those of you who just dropped in here in the last couple of minutes. Melina says, flexible schedule with the bills paid too. Fantastic. So some, you're talking about some freedom there, some flexibility with your life. Why do you want that, Melina? What is that going to give for you to have more flexibility? All right. Jeff says, want to know where to find the business I want. All right. Be more specific there about the, the business you want. Are you talking about looking to acquire a business? Uh, Gary says steady work. So getting away from, it sounds like you might be suffering from the typical feast and famine cycle of, you know, maybe having 10 projects right now and then in a couple months having one or two projects and not having that, that steady flow of work. Okay, Todd says enough money to set aside for retirement. Right, you want to retire in wealth, hopefully, live a rich life. Carol says, how to start design build firm. David says, bigger and better projects. I'm a one-person firm, and my wife works full-time for a big firm, and we'd like for her to work for our firm full-time. All right. Wesley says, leading my team well with minimal, uh, with minimal distractions. David says, workload has dropped off in the last four months looking for steady work. Yep, yep. All right. What else? I know there's some more of you on here that haven't, haven't put in you know, where do you want to get to? What brings you What brings you to take an hour out of your schedule today to join me and Joanne on this presentation today? All right, Judith says, working less, remove, uh, removing clients who think it's okay to get work out of me and not pay. Ooh, ouch. Right, well, that's something we can definitely address. All right, so we kind of went over that, where you are now. Now, here's, here's the big problem is that no one ever teaches us how to make and achieve goals. So in architecture school, I was never taught how to make goals. I was taught how to design buildings. I was taught how to solve problems. I was taught how to sketch and how to draw. Yes, we actually did that back when I went to architecture school. But no one ever taught me how to meet goals, how to make and meet goals, right? So this is, I feel this is something that, you know, unless we seek it out, no one really teaches to it. And there really is an art and a science to being able to make and achieve goals. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You're going to walk away with one big goal and a plan to reach it. Now, on your sidebar, I've uploaded a worksheet. And I'd just like you to take a couple of seconds there. If you click on that, you'll be able to download it. It's a PDF file. And hopefully you can be able to print that out. If you can't, despair not because it's a pretty simple worksheet. I'll show you how you can, if you have a piece of paper handy, I'm just going to pull a piece of paper out of my printer here. 
because this is this is a working implementation uh, webinar workshop, right? The goal of this isn't for me just to be sitting here speaking and pontificating to you, but actually to get our hands dirty, roll up our sleeves, and get something done together. So if you'll notice under handouts on the side, there's a link to a 90-day goals worksheet. And go ahead and open that up. Print that out if you have the ability. If you don't have the ability to print it out, no problem. I'll just show you what you can do. Take a piece of paper and vertically divide it into three three sections. Okay, that's what we're going to use today during today's presentation. So hopefully you all saw that. All right. That's where we're going to write down our plan. Okay, now I do have a couple of polls that I want to run here. These are going to appear right on your screen. So if you do me a favor and just click on the answer that, that best represents you. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to know for those of us on here today, you know, what is the primary focus of your firm? Now you can just click on one of these answers. Is it primarily single family residential? Are you doing custom homes and remodels, renovations? Is it non-single family residential? This would be people who are doing institutional work, commercial work. You know, if you're working for industrial or anything that's non-SFR, even if you're doing multifamily, you'd click that second option. Uh, and number number three, perhaps you do a little bit of both. Perhaps you do, you know, kind of light light uh, light commercial and residential work. You know, kind of a mix of that. Or the last option is other. And after you click one of these options, we'll all be able to see here on the webinar today where we all stand. It will give us a good feel for what we're all doing here. All right, so I can see that we have about 77% of you have voted. I'm going to leave this up for a couple more seconds, and then we'll show it down. Five, four, three, two. If you haven't voted, just click one of those options there on the screen. One. All right, I'm going to close this off here. And let's have a look. All right, so here we go. Look at that. We're about, about, uh, you know, a quarter and a quarter and a quarter split all the way down. That's very interesting. For the 29, almost 30% of you that put other, I'm curious, just drop into the chat box there what the other is. I'm curious for those of you that put the other. What is the other? You design spaceships. You design, you know, perhaps you're a sustainability consultant. Let me know what the other is. Maybe you're in the marketing department. Be curious to know. Harry, building official. All right, very cool. All right, Courtney, facade repair of existing buildings. And, oh, Wesley, chief of facility engineering at a VA medical center. Oh, that is awesome. Glad to have you on here. That's my background is actually mostly in uh, medical medical work. So that's very cool. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. Let's jump into a couple questions about you and your personal life in terms of setting goals. All right, so here's the question. I regularly set goals. Please select one, yes or no. And this is 100% anonymous. I won't even see which one you answered. It's just aggregated, so you don't need to worry about anyone seeing specifically your particular answers. So I see here we have about 74% of you have voted. Please go ahead and vote if you haven't already. And we're going to close down this poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, awesome. So we had 84% of you voted. Thank you for that. All right, so here we see is 61% of you regularly set goals. That's awesome. And 40% of you do not set goals, and that's okay because today I'm going to give you a framework that will hopefully inspire you to really use goals. You know, maybe you've set goals in the past and they just have never worked for you. I find a lot of people talking about that. All right, now we're almost at the end of our polls here. I'd like to ask you, those of you who set goals, this is going to apply to you, but I regularly set my goals and review them. So it's one thing to set goals. It's another thing to actually set the goals and review them. So just let me know. I'm going to turn on my webcam here for a second. Please respond to that. I regularly set my goals and I review them, yes or no. So we have about 55% of you have voted. Go ahead. If you haven't answered, even if you're on the no side, for instance, if you don't set goals, then you just click no. Go ahead and drop in that answer there. And we're going to close down this poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, here we go. Check this out. Look at that. 50, 50, 50, 50. That is cool. Right down the middle. So we can see here that half of you are regularly setting and reviewing your goals and half of you are not. That's pretty incredible. Here's a quote. Uh, by boxer Mike Tyson. Wasn't he a powerhouse? Any of you who you know watched boxing, Mike Tyson was an amazing boxer. 
But he said this quote before a fight one time, and it, it really deals with what we're talking about today in terms of goals. Because you know the 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 truth behind this is the reason why most people don't achieve the change in their lives that they want. Okay, so I'd like to know from you. What do you think? What do you think Mike Tyson's getting at here with this particular statement? Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Cool. Wesley says, I love that quote. Awesome. Right. So what exactly was Mike Tyson saying here? How does this relate to setting goals? Awesome. Judith says, stay flexible. What else? While you're thinking about that, I'm just going to read you uh, a, a newspaper reporter had the opportunity to talk to Mike Tyson right before a fight, and and uh, and this newspaper reporter asked him about this quote because you know it kind of gone viral, and so Tyson had the opportunity to respond to what he meant by this. I'm just going to read this to you. So the reporter says people were asking that Tyson told him people were asking me before a fight what's going to happen. They were talking about, you know, Tyson said they were talking about his style. He's going to give you a lot of lateral movement. He's going to move. He's going to dance. He's going to do this and that. And Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get hit. Then, like a rat, they stop in fear and freeze. And so the reporter says, what I like so much about this quote is that its application stretches far beyond boxing. It really has meaning in any area of life, whether the blow comes from a health issue losing your job, making a bad investment, a traffic jam, or whatever. It's, and here's the key. It's how you react to that adversity that defines you, not the adversity itself. Okay, and I'm just going to repeat that. It's how you react to that adversity that defines you, not the adversity itself. So most of us have set goals. The people who achieve the goals are the, it, you know, are the people that react in a certain way to the adversity because we know that all of us are going to get adversity that is going to come in the way of the goals and the changes that we want to make in our life. So what separates the people that don't achieve anything or the things that they would like in their life versus the people that do is how they react to that adversity, right? So Tyson continues, said, exactly, Tyson said, if you're good and your plan is working, somewhere during the duration of that, the outcome of that event you're involved in, you're going to get the wrath the bad end of the stick. Let's see how you deal with it. Normally people don't deal with it that well. He laughed. And then the reporter said, there's another way to spin his famous quote. How much can you endure, buddy? He said, most talkers, they can't handle it. Right? So in terms of achieving a goal, to make any change in our life, it's going to take force and it's going to take effort. What defines whether we're able to get closer to those goals or not is our drive and what we do when we're faced with adversity. Okay, let me know if that makes sense. Yep, and Wesley says, every plan is perfect until you begin to execute it. Sort of like war, initial contact upsets every plan. That is exactly right. And you're probably uh, very familiar with the quote. It's a military quote by originally attributed to Helmuth von Motke. No battle plan, he, he supposedly said, or actually he did say, survives contact with the enemy. So what does that mean? No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. That means that when we make our goals at the beginning of the year, we're going to map out a certain way to reach those goals. And over the course of the year, those that plan must change. It must change because we're going to, you know, we're going to get in contact with the enemy. Things are going to get in the way. And if we're not con constantly reviewing those goals and changing them, then that's where the battle plan doesn't survive. Cool. All right. So today we're going to talk about how do you how do you get the gumption or the stick with itness or whatever it is to be able to stick with your goals and ha create the massive desire the the massive action plan that you need that that inspires you right so today's presentation is, is on how to make goals with the heart we're going to talk about setting goals in a different way than you probably been taught to make goals before is anyone familiar with this quote the BHAG or this quote this this acronym BHAG. It was come up by uh, Jim Collins, business consultant, in his book, uh, Built to Last, How to Make Companies That Endure, Your BHAG. And he goes on to say that a BHAG stands for a big, hairy, audacious goal. All right, big, hairy, audacious goal. Something big, something grand. Why do we need something big and something grand? Well, here's a Chicago architect, right? Here's what he said. He said, Make no, and I love this quote, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. 
So whose blood is he talking about here? Whose blood needs to be stirred by these plans? Whose blood needs to be stirred? I'll submit that it needs to be your blood that needs to be stirred. That's right. Wesley says our own. 100%. Our goals need to be big enough that it stirs our blood. If it doesn't get us exciting, if it doesn't get us excited, then it's not a, it's not a goal that's going to drive us to action. It's not going to survive contact with the enemy. So the bigger, the bolder, and the more exciting to you your goals are, the clearer you paint that picture, the more motivated you are to get them done, right? So the reason why a lot of goals fail is that people never paint the picture clear enough to have an emotional connection with their goals. They never paint that picture clear enough. Here's a secret about the subconscious. Our, your subconscious mind cannot distinguish reality from imagination. Is anyone familiar with that concept? So our subconscious mind perceives our thoughts and the images we put into our mind as reality. That's why if you're getting ready for a speech, think about a time when you were extremely nervous, when you had butterflies in your stomach, you were just sweaty palms and fear. Maybe you're going to a big presentation where you had a lot on the line, right? Is you, if you're playing that out in your mind, your body is reacting to that situation as if it's actually happening. I mean, that is absolutely incredible because what that tells us is we can create situations, thoughts, images in our mind that give our own body biochemical responses and basically fool our subconscious into thinking something has already happened. So let's tie that in to making our goals. Okay, I want to do an experiment right now and let's do that with your goals. I want you to pick a time. I want you to think back for a second. Just close your eyes. If you have your cell phone on or any distractions, trust me, this will be worth 10 minutes. This little 10 minute exercise will be, you know, pay very, very high dividends. The question for you is, and you don't need to type this in the chat box, but on your paper that you've either printed out or that you have in front of you that's divided into three sections vertically, right at the top, when is a time in business when you were 100 out of 100 emotionally? So if we think about your motivation, your excitement, uh, your thirst for life, you know, uh, when were you 100 out of 100? If we think that, you know, zero is utter depression, wanting to lay in bed and not even get up and, you know, attack the day. That's zero. And a hundred is you're just full of life and energy and you're on top of the world and you're excited about all the possibilities in front of you. You know, when is a time when you were a hundred out of a hundred? And if you feel like sharing, that would be fantastic. Uh, you know, perhaps it's when you just won a really good project. You know, one time for me was when I was applying to architecture schools, I really wanted to go to Cornell University really, really badly because I just thought that that would just solve all of my problems. And so when I got that acceptance letter from Cornell, I was just like, boom, I was 100 out of 100 uh, emotionally. And I can still remember that feeling of excitement and elatement, you know, being able to go to this fancy smancy, uh, you know, Eastern school. So the question for you is, when is a time in business that you were 100 out of 100 emotionally? And go ahead and just write that down. Take a minute to write that down in the upper box. And also drop that into the chat box. I'd love to hear a time when you were 100 out of 100 emotionally. All right, Todd says, when I was finally able to quit my job and start my own practice. That was awesome. David, interesting, same, similar thing, when I started my own business. Very cool. Oh, interesting. Everyone's saying when I started my own practice. That's cool. Melina says first year of private practice. Scott says when I started my own business. Steve says starting my own practice. Carol says when I was designing a, a home, I designed. When I was building a home, I designed. Okay, fantastic. What I'd like you to do now is just everyone, you know, if you're participating, look, if you're on this presentation today, you're only going to get the most out of it if you participate, right? Sure, you can get some continuing education credits, but if you're just sitting here not participating in the uh, in the exercise, then you're missing out on a huge opportunity. So I hope everyone is participating with us, even if you're not putting in the check box, because this is this is for you, 100%. All right, so what I'd like you to do here is just to close your eyes for a minute, and even if there are people around you or you have multiple people watching this, it may feel a little goofy, <laughs> it may feel a little airy-fairy, but trust me, this works. Close your eyes, and I want you to reimagine that feeling and reimagine that time in your life. Okay, when it was just take yourself back, you know, in my case, when I got that acceptance letter or, you know, when you started your practice or when you were, uh, 
uh, building that house you designed. Feel that again in your heart, but not just feel it. Actually, paint the mo- uh, do the movie in your mind. So recreate the images. What did that look like? You know, see yourself, Carol, you talked about the house. See yourself actually going out to the job site and supervising the construction of that home and feeling that feeling in your heart again. Relive that. Smell the smells. Feel that until let me know when you can feel at least a, you know, a portion of that emotion back in your heart again about that particular time that you had. And this applies to everyone. So Joanne, even you, I know, you know, you're, you're not an architect, but you do run this organization to be fantastic. If hopefully you're participating in this as well, you know, just thinking about a time when, when you had success in your life and you were a hundred out of a hundred emotionally, we really want to lock that in. All right. So hopefully everyone's locked that emotion in. You're feeling it. Are you feeling it? Can you feel a portion of that of that emotion that you had during that time. Okay, I see some yeses. Okay, fantastic. All right, so now let's move on to number two. I want you to pick out what is what is something, what's a goal that would get you to feel that way again and on a daily basis what's something in your life that you could achieve that would help you rekindle that feeling of being 100 out of 100 and don't hold back so look here's this guy Grant Cardone I don't know if anyone's seen his reality TV show he's a reality TV star but he's a sales trainer And he has a show where he basically, it's kind of a reality TV show where he he shows about how he runs his sales organizations. Uh, He's a multiple New York Times bestselling author, $100 million business. And in his book, um, in one of his recent books that he just came out with, because he's written several of them, he said that his one regret, and this is very interesting, he said that my one regret is that I didn't think 10 times bigger my one regret, I mean, this is a guy who, from all intents and purposes, has it all, right? I mean, he looks healthy, he's fit, you know, he has fame, he has money, uh, you know, he hopefully he has good relationships because that is just as, if not more important than all those other things. But he said, he said, you know, my one regret is that I didn't think 10x. So I want to encourage you, as you're making this goal, don't let that little voice in your mind say, you know, we're not talking about achievable goals here right now. Let's just get achievable off the board, okay? Because you know what? Achievable does not inspire you. It may inspire you, but most likely it doesn't. So I'm not going to discount your goal just because you may think it's not achievable. Don't listen to that voice in your mind. If you want to be the next Frank Gary, by golly, write down, I'm going to be the next Frank Gary, you know? Or if you don't want to be the next Frank Gary, that's fine. Write that down too. But what is a goal, professional goal here, business goal, that would make you feel that 100 out of 100? Does everyone have something that gets them to 100 out of 100? Okay, awesome. So Gary says, rebuilding the practice after several years of working elsewhere. Carol says, yes, I have it. Hopefully everyone has that goal on that piece of paper. Cool. David, I love it. Thinking big. Interesting international projects. So tell me more about that. We really got to paint that picture. Tell me what we're going to do now under what your goal is, is we're going to paint that picture of, you know, of interesting international projects. So are you flying, what, flying once a month to exotic locations? Let's paint that picture of what that looks like. Let's get really detailed about that. So now after, you know, uh, Gary, you say rebuild the practice after several years of working elsewhere, right? So let's be detailed about that. What kind of office do you want to have? What kind of projects do you want to be working on? What kind of clients do you want to be working with? What kind of money do you want to be making? Vacations you want to be taking? Use the middle section of that worksheet to write down that vision story. Right. So what we're really going here isn't so much a goal. It's more a vision story of what would make you feel 100 out of 100. Okay, so what is the vision story that you could paint? The little mini, you know, if you're directing a movie, What would that look like? What time do you go into the office? What kind of cars do you drive? I mean, whatever gets you excited. Maybe you have more time to spend with your partner, significant other, your family, grandchildren. 
maybe you're able to, you know, participate in some hobbies or some some golfing or or work on, you know, critically acclaimed projects and win awards. What is it that gets you totally fired up and excited? All right, David says two to three medium large projects in Europe, Asia, and Australia. I love it. Love it. Todd, rehab and develop my own properties. Right, Todd. So go with me here. You know, in your mind's eye, look at those properties, see them, see you transforming them, look at the designs. You probably have already done this because obviously you've been thinking about this for a while. So I want you to relive that now. All right, David says travel with partner, wife, and the kids. Absolutely. Very cool. All right, so hopefully you're thinking 10x. Okay, now number three is what are the one to three things that you can do in the next 90 days to get you closer to that goal? Right, this is very, very simple, but let's just talk about, you know, so you have your vision story, and I invite you to, uh, I am recording this webinar. I'll send out the link to, uh, to Joanne so she can send out the link to all of you. It would be worthwhile to go back and review and refresh this training every so often so you can stay focused on this goal. But the goal about the vision story is that it's not that you, you know, put it in a filing cabinet somewhere and forget about it. I want you to put it on a wall somewhere, revisit it again at a time in the future, and go through this exercise again. Hopefully on a daily or, pro you know, a weekly basis usually works pretty well. Of You know, thinking about that 100 out of 100 emotionally, watching that movie in your mind of having been at that place of success that you want to be at, okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to figure out in the next 90 days, what are one to three things that you can do to get you that much closer to your goal? All right, David, awesome. David says, reach out and network to meet international clients. Love it. Love it. So there you go. You know, uh, figure out who are those clients, what kind of products you want to be working on, reach out to them, meet them. Judah says, find a way to get paid for services so I don't have to work so much. Yeah, well, if you're giving away a lot of stuff for free, that would be an excellent 90-day goal is figuring out the strategies to be able to charge for the value that you're providing. All right, David says, you know, participate in some international competitions. Love it. Carol says, build my custom design build firm, overseeing all the drafts, people, subs, etc. on large custom residences. I'm able to come and go without working under someone. Very cool. Uh, Todd's going to start talking to potential investment partners. Right, get out there. Uh, you know, interact and 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 uh, network with those people. Gary, I misread your comment, Gary. It looked like you said cold calls are my favorite thing, <laughs> but you said cold calls are my favorite thing to avoid. <laughs> Ads are expensive. <laughs> That's right. Yes, I think cold calls are all of our favorite things to avoid. Yeah, and ads are expensive. So look, that's a potential stumbling block. So you might be looking at, you know, as you go through this visioning exercise, what's going to happen is your mind is going to throw up reasons why you can't achieve that thing. That's just natural, right? You're the the uh, the little monkey in the back of your mind, the lizard brain, as Seth Godin likes to call it, or you know, the imposter syndrome. It's going to be shouting at the back of your mind. You're going to have this little voice saying, "You're not good enough." You know what? Ads are expensive. It's going to throw all these roadblocks up about why you cannot achieve that. You need to recognize that that's just the mind in your voice telling you. That's just your voice in your mind telling you that, right? And that does not necessarily represent reality. All right, so there we go. So now you have one to three things you can do in the next 90 days to get closer to that goal, all right? So what we've just gone through is a powerful framework to set goals with the heart and not with the head. Because one of the problems and the mistakes that we usually make and that I've made in the past um, up until recently is thinking with my head, I want to be so, you know, I want to have X number of revenue. I want to go on X number of vacations. I want to do X and X and X. You know, I want to go to the gyms X number of times. And it's it's been a very heady exercise, you know. As, as architects and, you know, as we went to college, most of us probably, um, you know, we're very analytical thinkers. And so we like to plan things out. We're planners. And we like to think things through in our head right? But it doesn't engage the emotion, right? Remember the, the quote from Daniel Burnham where he said, make no small plans because they have no magic to stir men's blood. Or, you know, Mike Tyson that said, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what's going to allow you to overcome that is being really closely tied to your emotional state, to have some emotions tied to that. So you're setting these goals with your heart and not your head. 
Okay, so that's the end of today's presentation. This was just a shorter presentation than most, but it's meant to be a workshop and it's meant to give you a framework that you can use in the future again and again and again to revisit your goals and make sure that your goals are tied in to emotions, your desires, and your drives so that when the difficulties come, that you just roll over them like a Jeep running over, you know, a Jeep running over a boulder in the middle of the road. Okay, now what I'd like to know is. What is your biggest takeaway from today's short little mini workshop that we had here? I just like to lock this in. I'd like to thank everyone for being on here today. You know, um, and one thing that, you know, one thing I was worried about when I share this kind of concept is it does seem pretty, you know, we might call it airy fairy, a little personal development, you know, kind of like, uh, um, it's easy to discount this and say, oh, that's a bunch of foo-foo. However, I found that this worked in my life. And any of you, if you've used these strategies in your own lives, hopefully you found the same, right? So, Joanne, how, hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, yeah, in particular, I mean, the worksheet is a great tool, um, very helpful to move forward. <clears throat> and I like the emotional connection to goal setting because it puts it in a different perspective. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. So Scott's big takeaway is dream big. I love it. Hopefully I've inspired everyone to dream big. Melina says that I'm not alone. And Jim says, make my goals bigger, more exciting, and emotionally charged. That's right. So let's go back just really quickly back to this, this um, because I think that's a good point, Jim, that I probably didn't touch on enough. But you know, it's the old the old concept of if you shoot for the stars, you land on the moon. You know, we've all kind of heard that. So one of the benefits of the dreaming big is fooling ourselves into thinking, and I just say fooling, you know, uh, one time I heard Richard Meyer speak at school and he said something interesting. He said, uh, he said, you can achieve anything you put your mind to. You can achieve anything you can put your mind to. And I remember thinking at that time, I had a lot of, uh, I was, I was like, oh, come on, you know, that's a bunch of, that's a bunch of BS, you know, obviously I can't achieve anything I put my mind to, you know, um, but you know, what did he mean by that? And since that time, I've, I've figured out at least a portion of what he means is that we need to fool ourselves, so to speak, into believing. We need to believe the empowering lie. What is the empowering lie? The empowering lie is that we can achieve the 10x, right? Because that's what's going to get us to grow and to stretch uh, beyond where we thought we could. And so that's what Grant Cardone meant here. So fantastic insight there, Jim, making those goals bigger and more exciting. Wesley says, take away, take goals in short sprints week at a time, 90 days. Yeah, if you haven't read the book, the, uh, what is it, the 12-week year, the 12-week year, um, Wesley, I recommend you read that, You're talking about those 90-day, those sprints. Uh, there's a concept that was really developed by Olympic athletes uh, from Russia back in the 70s and the 60s called periodic training, periodization. What they did is instead of, instead of trying to train for a year and having a a, you know, kind of measuring the progress over a year, they basically said, let's compress that down into short sprints of training, and they were able to supercharge their results. And so we're doing kind of the same thing here with our goals, is really breaking those down. So in that book, The 12-Week week, week Year, if you've read it, it talks about breaking your goals down into a 12-week time period so that we're not, you know, in December, we're not looking back at our goals and saying, oh, man, how much of this can I get done? So that's powerful. Thanks for that. All right, Judith says, focusing my time on the important, not the immediate. All right, David says, I tend to set smaller goals. Definitely enjoyed thinking big. It's much more stirring to think about a goal that I want rather than what I need. Gary says, charge forward. I've always responded to challenges and everything I ever got was worth it. P.S. I got C's in high school and A's in architecture school. Cool. Interesting. There you go. So you were inspired, right? Because you saw the, the opportunity there. Steve says, looking for bigger opportunities. Frank says, goal setting is great. How do I get my partners on the same page with large goals? I want to set larger goals. Get outside of the comfort zone. That's an interesting question. Does anyone have any feedback on that? Yeah, Frank asks a very interesting question, which is, um, how do I get my partners on the same page with large goals? Um, I found personally in my own life that you know the partner it needs to come from themselves. So there's probably something that's holding them back from not you know not having that bigger vision. And truthfully, a lot of times it comes down to personal doubt or personal, you know, kind of like doubt in what they can achieve. Uh, so part of it's going to be understanding where they're coming from and then just helping to inspire them. Let me know if anyone else has some 
uh, some questions, uh, you know, some ideas there for Frank. That's a great question. All right. Uh, Wesley says, working for the government, I take everything one quarter, 12 weeks at a time. Awesome. Carol says, uh, how to get others on board? You know, one way, one way to get others on board is to talk about, you know, whole, you know, talk about a vision for your firm. Now, I know we know in business that this is something that we're all supposed to do, right, is do strategic planning. We're all supposed to have a company vision. But how many of us actually have a strategic plan and a company vision? Okay, do you really have a company vision? Did you take a retreat at the end of last year and talk about where ideally you want your business to be? So I would think that would be, that's what I would do. I mean, that's what I do with my partners and the people I work with, Carol, is to get others on board. I basically, you know, it has to come from them. I can't put it on them. So we get together and we say, okay, what's your vision? You know, and I take them through this visioning exercise and just make sure that when you're at, when you, if you're going through this, if you're leading it yourself, then, or you're leading it as a group, you know, make sure that they're getting, engaging the emotions, that they're not making the goals from their head. You know, you want to make sure they're engaging their heart and they're talking about what gets them excited emotionally. All right, Wesley says, paint the vision for your partners of where you see the firm in five to 10 years. Yeah, that's Wesley. That's a real great, that's a leadership skill there is being able to paint that vision, infuse it into your meeting. So in your meetings that you're having, hopefully you're having, you need to be having at least two meetings a week with your firm. Uh, you need to be revisiting your vision. So the vision needs to be a part of your weekly meetings. All right, David says, I think achievement is contagious. If your partners see you setting goals and achieving them, even if small, while also enjoying it with a positive attitude, then they may start to join. That's right. Uh, Melina says, to get partners on board by dividing the goal up to match what each partner uh, can best bring to, uh, to the fight. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for your participation today. We're going to be ending about, you know, a little bit early here, which is hopefully good news. I'm sure you're going to put it to good use. Uh, feel free to ask any additional questions there. If you want to get a hold of me, you can respond to any of the emails you got. I'm also going to send you a follow-up email with the link to this presentation, and so you can review it. Um, uh, Wesley says, give us more info about your podcast. Absolutely. So for those of you who... You know, you find yourself driving around during the day and you want to listen to the Business of Architecture podcast. If you just go to businessofarchitecture.com, um, let's see here. I'll show you this to you really quickly. Every week I produce a new podcast episode and I try to get guests that are really inspiring, that will feed your mind, that will inspire you to take greater action, that will give you tips and tricks for, you know, attracting more of the kind of clients and products you want. So if you go to businessofarchitecture.com and click on podcast, there's a couple options there. You can, all right, so uh, anyways, if you go to the site, if you just click on, for instance, latest podcast episode, so I can click here on latest one with Karen Compton, she's a fantastic uh, consultant that works with architecture firms, build your architecture firm dream. So to answer your question, Wesley, without going into too much detail, you could just go to businessofarchitecture.com and then all the subscription links are down here about how to subscribe. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, David says, thank you, Enoch. Great webinar. It was my first one. I'm looking forward to more. Also looking forward to catching your podcast. Cheers. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, get out there. You know, I, I try to put a lot of effort into making that really exceptional. So hopefully that helps you out a lot. Uh, Joanne, I'm going to turn it back over to you to wrap us up here. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this informative and actionable program. It's really refreshing. Um, the fact that we can um, move forward and, and think in a 90-day compartment is great. I think it makes things more doable, more um, uh, the thought of, of getting something done versus just leaving with, you know, an open time frame. I like the fact that this 90 days is very um, doable, and hopefully everyone else uh, felt the same way. Um, thank you so much to all the attendees today. Um, if, um, if you need um, AIA credit, again, if you did not give us your number when you registered, just go ahead and email us at ala at alatoday.org, and we will, uh, if you could do that by the end of today, then we'll, we'll report those credits um, within a few days here. Thank you so much again, and um, with that, Enoch, um, you have a great day. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Appreciate it, Melina and Kevin and all those that have been typing in and thanking those of you who participated. Really appreciate it, and once again, thank you, Joanne, and the Association of Licensed Architects. You're welcome.